Diaz, um, uh, formerly the uh, CEO of uh, Kindred, recently retired and now executive chairman. And we're going to go over some uh, topics today. And, uh, Great to be here. And um, we'll, uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, let's talk first public policy. I know you do a lot of work on the Hill. You've been in this business for 25 plus years. Um, you've watched the states and the federal government. You've seen what they've done. You've seen what they've changed over the years. What's the federal government doing well right now with regard to post-acute care? Well, I think, um, you know, first, I, I think we should all breathe a sigh of relief and, and recognize the speaker's leadership and uh, Leader Pelosi's leadership on, on getting the doc fix done. I mean, the doc fix has been a 10-year overhang on health care services, and post-acute providers have always been you know, a disproportionate pay for in the doc fix. So having that resolved uh, uh, now means that policymakers can actually think about more reform oriented policy. And so I, I think we are past just budget driven, doc fix driven, you know, healthcare policy. And I think what you're beginning to see is Chairman, um, well, not no longer Chairman Wyden, but Senator Wyden really focused on, uh, you know, the care of chronic patients with chronic conditions. And I encourage folks to look at a USA, to Ar USA Today article recently, and I ha happen to have given a, a similar talk about, you know, how much of the Medicare program is spending on patients with three or more uh, chronic conditions. And, and those are post-acute patients. So I think there's a great deal of attention on how the Medicare program and the duals and the Medicaid program can manage the explosion of patients with multiple chronic diseases um, and the societal and economic challenge around that. You're also seeing in, in the House, uh, led by uh, uh, Kevin Brady, Chairman Brady of the Health Subcommittee, Chairman Ryan of, of Ways and Means, a great interest in beginning to move away from fee-for-service and thinking about post-acute care. And so um, people should really look at and study the Impact Act that was passed last year that set forth a framework that we were supportive of it and many others were supportive of it. And Kevin Brady uh, led this charge, Chairman Brady led this charge about, you know, how do we begin to understand what good post-acute care should look like? So it calls for really moving forward on a common patient um, assessment instrument across post-acute settings, trying to establish value metrics, and um, and we're seeing now some discussions in, in the health subcommittee about actually trying to move some proposals forward on value-based purchasing, whether it's rehospitalizations or functional improvement, patient satisfaction, et cetera. You know, I think that's going to take some time. I think you know if you look at the Impact Act as a framework. For that, you know, it, it calls for the introduction of that stuff in 2019, 2020, once CMS has got the data and once the benchmarks can be established. But I think providers would be smart to look at that impact act and use it as a basis for their strategic planning to prepare their operations for how are we going to manage better and, and think about being paid for delivering higher quality care more efficiently and, and in a different payment system that we're in today. So what's the federal government doing poorly? I, I think the biggest problem with the, is, is the Medicaid system. We've gone from losing you know, $15 a day in Medicaid to losing $35 a day in Medicaid in many states. That's an unsustainable you know, cross-subsidization. You know, obviously, MedPAC doesn't believe it's its responsibility for the Medicare program to subsidize Medicaid. Um, is that a federal government issue? Is that really more the states? Because the states well, it's set both. the rates. I mean, it is a senator senator for Medicaid and Me Medicare and Medicaid policy, and and most of the dollars are federal. I mean, you know, so so we really need to if we're if we're going to really tackle the long-term care needs for patients with chronic illness and thinking about, and that doesn't mean that we're not thinking about home care and home and community-based services and adult daycare and, and assisted living uh, or, or those kinds of, of, of products 
but we just have to think about the duals and we have to think about Medicaid differently. And, and particularly given the obsolescence of skilled nursing. You know, and, and that's where I think the biggest policy issue is. Because you know, home-based care models are gonna solve a lot of these problems and, the, and, and population health at home, but there aren't homes for many of these patients. And we are gonna need to find you know, 21st century you know, care settings uh, for patients. And, and right now the Medicaid program is wholly inadequately focused on that. Mm. Mm. But is this, I mean, when you look at policy, is this a legislative issue? Is this a White House issue? I mean, where, where is it going to come from? Well, I, I, think, uh, I, I think it has to start at the federal level, but it has, to, it, it has a huge state component. I mean, it, you know, um, we may see um, governors where a, a lot of innovation has happened sort of take charge of this, trying to figure out within the waiver programs uh, to develop, you know, more home and community-based services, you know, Governor Kasich in, in Ohio, but they're, but they're, I think they need to focus more, not just on home health, uh, on palliative care, and I think, you know, if 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 we could create payment models that that start solving to what patients really want, which is, you know, a more dignified way to deal with chronic conditions and end of life. And, and, um, and, and figure out where home should be, where home is an active place, where home is a place that you're getting the socialization you need and the right meds that you need. Um, uh, that's going to have to happen because we are going to see the boomers need a, 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 pl a plethora of, of services. Mm -hmm. And then do you, I mean, when will we stop seeing Medicare funding the Medicaid Shortfall is that ever going to happen? Is Medicaid are Medicaid rates going to rise? Or, I mean, what's what's going to policy wise? What I think I think the only thing that? the only thing that's going to change policy is when you have an access problem, and and we are far from having an access problem. Um, the problem with the access problem being the driver is that once you have the access problem, it's it takes. It, 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 there's going to be a lot of dislocation because you can't solve it right away. So if we wait until there's an access problem, then we're going to have a really big societal problem. Does that make sense? Mm, uh, sort of. But um, I guess, you know, the problem is, I guess, any big change, you never know what's going to be the result. I mean, take, take what happened with uh, the prospective payment system. Right. Uh, you know, that came in. I was a little bit of a minority on that. Um, the industry knew it was coming. Well, you and I were not minorities. I mean, we were the minorities in that. They knew it was coming. They knew what was going to happen. The companies were still buying, buying. Just remember, I sold energy. into that. I know. <laughs> so <laughs> some of us knew. Some of us, and then everyone blamed PPS on the wave of the corporate bankruptcies, um, and yes, that contributed to it. But well, you took nine billion dollars out of the program. What did you think was going to happen? I mean, that that was the the industry's fault. Yeah, they didn't. They they knew it, but didn't want to deal with it. But they knew it, and they didn't want to deal with it. And people were overly levered, and overly dependent on the ancillaries. And the great tragedy that came out of that for, you know, four or five years until the rug system really took hold, is during that time, you know, rehab became undervalued, and rehab is a critically important part of what seniors need to maintain quality of life, maintain functionality, prevent falls, prevent hospitalizations. Um, and we've seen great strides in, in the rehab intensive programs that skilled nursing facilities do right now. And we're not talking enough about the return to home that we're seeing in skilled nursing and the reduction in rehospitalizations and, and, and the outcomes that we're driving with intensive rehab. Uh, and, and that's a shame. Yeah. Something we need to talk more about. Now, when you look at Congress, and, and I'm going to go out there a bit, and you probably will disagree, you know, these guys, I don't. I'm going to say up to 10% of the members of Congress don't really know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, I've heard them make major mistakes in what they're talking about. And I'm going to go even further and say maybe 40, 50%. Um, wouldn't be able to really tell you, you know, a good definition of dual eligibles. So how, if we're looking at Congress to, you know, on a political side to look at the, you know, what to do, voting on, 
if they don't know the basics, how are they going to really well, you know, I, implement I, these changes? I, I, I you know, th there are, um, you know, first of all, uh, like society, there's there's a spectrum of of capabilities in Congress, but. You know, for the, the vast majority of the members of Congress are, are fairly smart, fairly sophisticated people, and they actually do educational programs for incoming freshmen around policy issues. There are, and I think we, you know, whether it's the energy community or healthcare or technology, it's our job to try to create forums to educate people. So we have to take some responsibility for that. But I think what you find in the committees of jurisdiction. Um, as opposed to the broad, as I don't disagree with you, you know, if the broad uh, membership of Congress, many of them don't understand these issues. And, but, but in fairness, they're trying to understand foreign policy, energy policy, a, a pretty wide range of, of things that you and I can't speak intelligently to. I think if you look at the committees of jurisdiction, these members take it very seriously. They try to educate themselves. They try to listen to their constituents. Um, they, they, for the most part, have pretty smart staff. But you know, one of the challenges in government is you turn people over too quickly. And, um, and so you don't have that you know, built up institutional knowledge. Now, there are exceptions to that. Wendell Primus, who works for you know, Leader Pelosi, I mean, he's incredibly versant in these issues. You know, so um, Lisa Grayburn, that works for Kevin Brady and, and on, on ways in, on the health subcommittee. I mean, so you do have, you know, people who really understand these issues. I do think that we need to move past the cynicism, the skepticism, you know, in, in order to create a better public-private partnership, you know. And there's a little bit of a political spectrum there where many Democrats distrust for-profit health care providers. And uh, not all, but many. Um, and many Republicans, yeah, uh, you know, Eddie used to have this line. So, you know, Democrats love these programs but don't want to pay for them. And Republicans hate these programs but are kind of pragmatic that they've got to pay for them. We've got to move past that. And um, we do need a more honest public-private discussion um, because the government cannot execute on health care policy. And, and certainly one of the challenges with the Affordable Care Act is the notion that, that we can do innovation at CMS around health care. Um, I mean, I, I think we're going to have to move the center for innovation into a more public-private model. And we're seeing that in some of the struggles with the bundles and those things. But Did the industry learn anything from the PPS disaster? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that you have... Um, a, a more mature, sophisticated group of operators today than you've ever had. Um, uh, but I worry about the the radias and the and uh, structures and the REITs and and the bifurcation of the real estate and the operations. If you have underinvestment in the assets, or you have underinvestment in the systems and the people. So, and I'm not trying to put everybody in the same brush, but, you know, if, if, you, if you have, you know, as a series of financial transactions, all of the cash flow being dividended out and not being invested in the business, in health, electronic medical records, in staffing, in training, in, in creating 21st century physical plants, then you're not going to get 21st century quality. No, simple as that. It's one of the problems, I mean, I think it's kind of over now, but you take the skilled nursing industry. Um, when you had the major large corporate chains left uh, AHCA and kind of started their own lobbying group because their interests were different from a lot of the members of AHCA. Uh, I know they've rejoined and all that, but it's one of the problems that, you know, what Kindred wants to see happen policy-wise in Washington is different from the guy in uh, Pennsylvania who owns two nursing homes? You know, there's a little bit of that, but, but I would say um, for the most part, we want what everybody else wants. We want stability. You know, we, we want um, regulatory and payment stability so that we can all move forward. And I think, you know, uh, I think there are people who view public policy as, 
you know, LTACs need to lose for SNFs to win. But I think, you know, I think that's the minority. Or SNFs need to win at the expense of ERFs, or home health needs to win at the expense of SNFs. That win-lose paradigm is a, is a loser on, on Capitol Hill. And the associations that continue to focus that way are, are, are not going to get much traction. Um, I think Governor Parkinson, who's running AHCA, has made great progress there. You know, we get to see this from a broad spectrum. You know, um, I'm on the board of directors of the Federation of American Hospitals. We're obviously active in AHCA. I think the merger with the Alliance and AHCA has gone very well. It's kind of a, and, and the CPAC there. Um, but, you know, there are differences of, of opinion on, on, on certain policy. But I, I think from our perspective, you know, if, if we try to advocate for policy that's about getting patients to the right setting at the right time with the highest quality at the lowest cost, that's what we all have to be for. And, and that's our strategy, too. And it's convenient, obviously. But, you know, the, the win-lose strategy is not going to play. So what happens? You're, what, what happens if you're appointed king for the day in Washington? Is there some policy implementation that you would, I mean, you would just say, this has to be done, it's done today? Um, well, you, you know, it's interesting. And Chairman Baucus asked me that uh, one time. Um, you, know, f you know, first, I mean, I, I, I would say, one, I would, I would work really hard uh, and quickly to define value. You know, so, so, so we all need to, before we decide what we want to pay for or what we want to get, how do we want to define value for seniors? And, and seniors, I mean Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. So, and I think the value-based purchasing system that we talked about earlier is a step in that direction. But it's early, and, and obviously the devil's in the details. And, and, and I think we, we, the provider community, needs to be really you know, active in working with Congress on, on helping to define value and then a payment system that rewards, you know, high quality. Um, the second thing that, that you know, if, if, if I was running the Medicare program, I would take the chronically ill patients and, and define them and make sure that there was a patient navigator, a patient caregiver that was responsible for coordinating their care. It's like the single one thing that could really move the dial. And, um, and the Medicare program basically delegates that to Medicare Advantage and to others. But if, but if you really wanted to move the dial quickly, you define value, you start moving payments within the fee-for-service system to that, and then you really focus on the chronically, you know, the patients with three or more chronic conditions, and, and you figure out how you're going to have a, a nurse or a nurse technically really own a caseload of 30 or 40 of those patients and really manage, you know, be, be the quarterback of their care.